welcome to episode 20 of Board Game Breakfast for April 7th, 2014. This episode, we'd like to give a shout out to one of our Kickstarter backers, the North Texas RPG Convention. You can find out more information about them at ntrpgcon.com. They have a lot of old school Dungeons and Dragons there, as well as other. Uh, they pretty much allow any kind of role playing system there, like Pathfinder, etc. This is from June 5th to the 8th. You can find out more information at their website. Uh, this is just a funny picture somebody sent me last week. I was talking about Sore Losers, and this is one game club, they, what they have for Sore Losers. I found this to be hilarious. And let's see. Don't forget, you can also get the audio uh, files of this show and some of our other videos that we do throughout the course of the week at DicetowerAudio.com. But you're here for the news, so why are we delaying? Let's get to it. In the news, Stoneblade Entertainment is coming out with some expansion theme packs. These are small little packs of cards that you can add to Ascension, uh, like they have the Rat King and the Leprechaun. These are, many of them have been like promos that you can find before, but they're like little packs of cards with a theme. For example, when the Rat King comes out, uh, you'll pull rat cards and cover up every single card in Ascension. They're, they're very fun and it's a way to get cards that perhaps you weren't able to get before. Portal has announced a new expansion for 51st State called Ruins with some excellent artwork and basically the comment was, if you like 51st State, then you will like this expansion. Uh, Stronghold has joined the group of people who are on uh, Kickstarter. They'll be coming up with their uh, iOS version of Core Worlds. But in that same announcement, more interesting to us, of course, is a new expansion for Core Worlds, Revolution. It's going to be doing a lot of different things with heroes, and um, I'm just looking forward to seeing how that works with the regular game since Core Worlds is probably my favorite deck builder. Upper Deck has released more information on the fact that they have the Crow license, and they're talking about how they're going to be working with the stuff from the different movies, and there's a dedicated fan base, and people are really excited about this. I'm curious, are there people excited about this? Because I just don't know many Crow fans, but maybe that they're out there. AEG has started to preview cards from Doomtown, uh, the, the reprint that they're doing, uh, kind of like an uh, LCG style thing. The card looks very clean and good. There was a lot of April Fool stuff last week. Basically, you don't want to learn about any new board games on April 1st. Uh, like here's an example of something May Day did with Hoop and Stick, and it was a lot of that. We did our own April Fool's joke where we did our top 10 uh, obscure games, and three of the games did not exist, and we apparently fooled a lot of people. Didn't mean I thought people would catch it. Uh, Guillotine Games is going to be releasing a Zombicide Compendium, a 92-page book with all the official scenarios for Zombicide and several other ones added too. So if you want all your Zombicide missions in one book, you can get them from them. Z-Man has announced yet another reprint that they'll be doing, and this is Vikings. Vikings is a very solid game, although do not expect much Viking theme in it. And Tabletop. Uh, we just had the Tabletop Day. The Tabletop, the very popular show starring Will Wheaton, has a, a campaign funding on Indiegogo. Now, they're looking for half a million dollars to be able to do their third season of Indiegogo. As of when I recorded this, they were already at 300000 and that's on Indiegogo, which is a decidedly second platform to Kickstarter. So I assume they will easily reach their funding and go beyond that. I believe they said if they got to a million, they were going to do an RPG-style show. So that will be interesting to see. Okay, thanks a lot, Nick. And I wanted to say something real quickly about this. When it comes to Kickstarter news, there is a lot of Kickstarter games that come out every day. There are 10 or 12 probably a day on that, and that's an average. There's days with more of them. We honestly cannot talk about them all. So how do we pick it? Well, I told Nick just to use his discretion to pick whatever's interesting to him. He does not have to pick anything. He can do what he likes. And I really would prefer people not to get angry. You did not pick this game. It is not our job to s support these games and promote them, you know. Uh, a lot of times a, a, a project will be doing really well and they're looking for stretch goal people, you know, please help us reach a stretch goal. Why, why should we? You know, what we're doing is we're trying to promote board games in general, not help anyone out very specifically. So Nick can cover any games he wants and we'll cover any games we want. Now I try to, we try to give you comprehensive stuff. It's just impossible on Kickstarter. So we're just gonna do our best. And occasionally we will miss a game or two and that's unfortunate, but hopefully we'll cover uh, at least a lot of them. On to updates, and uh, actually, I have no information about upcoming games. This is a, just a week. I, there's not a lot that's being talked about that's coming down the pipeline. Some stuff was released last week, though. 
Carcassonne mini expansions. These are little tiny expansions. There's six of them. You can add one or all of them to your Carcassonne game. A lot of different restocks came back in the print. Kittens in a Blender is now in stock at Cool Stuff. Um, the, the name of that always gets people upset, but I, I believe the object of the game is to rescue the kittens from the Blender. Uh, the Doom Knight came to Atlantic City. We reviewed that. And the new expansion for Lords of Vegas is now out called Up, which you now are building these different casinos and you're building them upwards, not just out like that. All right, let's take a look at an iOS game. Hi, Suzanne here with a look at this week's featured board game app. Tired of the big city? Maybe you should look at the big suburbs instead. If you're looking for a board game app with all the bells and whistles, consider the iPad version of Ted Osbuck's Suburbia. Let's take a look at this popular hex-based game and see if it belongs in your digital collection. Can you develop the best suburb that draws in the highest population? Build your residential, commercial, industrial, and civic areas carefully. Guard your reputation and earn income, all in the hopes of drawing in the most residents. The key to victory is often in fulfilling the shared or private objectives and optimizing your selections and placements based on not just your own area, but your competitors' buildings as well. A beautiful and literal port of the tabletop game, Suburbia for iOS has all the features we expect of a premier game app and then some. In a unique approach to solo play, Suburbia features six different AIs to compete against, each categorized by their play style instead of their difficulty. On top of that, there is a full solo player campaign mode in which you must meet specific objectives to win all the stars and unlock all the cities. The only downside to the campaign mode is that it doesn't save mid-level when you play the game. But on the upside, you can unlock the Essence Spiel promo tiles by beating that city in campaign mode. And of course, Suburbia has a full tutorial and tile index, and it does have online play through Game Setter as well. One of the best aspects of playing the game on a device is that the game takes care of your income, reputation, and population tracks for you. Plus, you get this really helpful pop-up when you place a tile that shows you exactly the impact it has to your score and income. And the game log tracks every move, so you can go back and review the entire game if you want. The app has gone on sale a few times, and it's received regular updates to squash bugs and to add new content. With its clean design, challenging gameplay, and extensive features, Suburbia provides tons of suburb building fun. Give it a try! Internet, I didn't see you come in. Uh, so I'm Wayne, and Steve has asked me to, uh, well, step in because he's out busy, um, uh, oh, buying new shirts. Yeah, that'll work. Um, so I'm going to talk about some games. Why don't you come with me? So, first up, we're going to talk about trains and stations. It's by Eric Lang, friend of the cafe, and, uh, well, to be honest, it's got trains, which is good, if you like trains. It's got dice, you know, but uh, it's missing puppets. So, sorry Eric, but it sucks. No puppets, it sucks. But, you know, if you don't need puppets, give it a try. Okay. Next up, uh, King of Tokyo. This is a Richard Garfield game, and, uh, well, it doesn't have puppets either, but it's got monsters! But that's our word, so you shouldn't use it. Give it a try. And now, we're going to talk about Lords of Waterdeep from Wizards of the Coast. So, uh, it's a worker placement game. The workers are kind of like puppets, I guess, so... It gets a pass. You should play it. Yeah. And finally, we're going to talk about Panic on Wall Street! Ah! No puppets, no monsters, but it gets people acting crazy, so that's a good thing. You should probably play this one. Yeah. So. Why did you put in a car? Um, so, I think I gotta go. Yeah, I definitely gotta go now. Uh, bye bye! Wayne, why did you lock me in the closet? What did you do to my shirt? That is the last time I let a puppet do laundry. <sighs> I feel like we're a version of Sesame Street now. Maybe the Muppets, but then we would have to sing. Uh, that's coming. 
Um, I do want to talk a little bit about Tabletop Day. Now, Tabletop Day is a holiday. Uh, well, not a holiday, but I guess it's a, it's a day that the, the tabletop folks said, this is a day we're all going to get together and play games. And I was kind of skeptical when I first heard about this last year, but I saw that it worked. And this year, it worked even more. I don't know about all the different tabletop events, although I've been hearing good things. But I went to a tabletop event in um, Hollywood, Florida, at the Cool Stuff uh, there. And when I got there, I got there around 10 o'clock. And there was already about 20 people lined up, ready to get in the store. The store opened up at 10 a.m. and uh, people were playing games. At around 11.30, there was around uh, 57 board gamers. Now, as the day went by, more and more gamers came. And there was uh, collectible card gamers. And, and it easily went over 100. But what was exciting to me was at any given point, there was probably 15 to 20 different board games being played. I ran a tournament, the first tournament, I think, in the world of the new Marvel Dice Masters game. We had a 16-person tournament, and I could have had 32 people. I just didn't have the stuff to run a 32-person one. 16-person uh, one, and that seemed to go well. Everyone who played it said that they are looking forward to playing the game some more. Uh, Green Goblin is the favorite of the people who played, although a lot of people also like Captain America, got a lot of love, and just different characters, and people had fun with that. We also ran a pitch card tournament and just had a lot of fun playing the different games there. It was a great day, um, and one of the best things about the day was a lot of people came who didn't know about our meetup group, didn't know about our Facebook page, so I was able to connect with a lot of people. I spent much of the day going around and teaching games to, to new folks who were playing. Played one really cool new game that just came out, and you'll be seeing a review of that hopefully this week. All right, well, let's go visit Professor Nicholson. Hi there everyone, this is Scott Nicholson and welcome to the Ivory Dice Tower. Right now I'm looking at the concepts of meaningful gamification, which is a way of using elements of games and play to help people get motivated in the real world. I'm talking about my recipe for meaningful, meaningful gamification and today I'm going to be talking about the P from the recipe, or play. Now I've talked about play before in some earlier segments, but I wanted to address it now in this concept of using play to motivate people. The idea of play is you create a space where people feel free to explore that space. You create a space with some boundaries. And the idea is that you want to create those boundaries because then people feel safer exploring things. So you want to create a safe space for exploration. Now some important parts about play is that play needs to be optional. You need to choose to play. That you need to not feel like you're forced to play. And so thinking about how to make something that's a choice, that's an option. Another thing about play is that it needs to allow the freedom to fail. That people can try to play, they can try things out, they can fail, they can learn from failure. We actually learn a lot more from failure than we learn from success. And that's why play is actually such a popular way to help people learn something. Because it creates this space where you can explore, you can try, you can fail, you can improve, and you can try again. And there aren't these heavy consequences for failure. That's one of the frustrating things about some of our games that we have today, is actually some games create a space where you don't feel like you can try things that aren't necessarily going to work, because there may be such a heavy penalty for failure. So you go and play the game, and you, you, you get to this point and, and you, in a game where you're like, okay, I can choose one of two things. I can choose this path, which I know will get me points, and I know will help me move ahead, and I know it's what everyone else is, is expecting me to do, and it's making decisions, because that would be the best thing for me to do to earn points. But there's this other thing that would be awesome, and I really want to do this awesome thing even though it's not going to get me points, even though it's clearly maybe going to lose me the game, but it would be awesome. And you're torn. You've got on one side, you're like, no, Scott, you need to earn lots of points. And the other side saying, no, Scott, it's time to play. And many times I listen to this voice over here. When I do listen to this voice, though, sometimes other players get kind of annoyed with me because they say, oh, well, I was making decisions based on the fact that you would be trying to win the game. And not just, you know, what are you doing? Just playing around. And I'm like, yes, I'm playing. This is a game. But part of this is the social contract that you engage with other people around the game table. Whether you're engaging with them around a space saying everyone is going to do, always make choices to try and win the game. Or it's a space saying, hey, let's just play. And let's fail. And let's see how failure works. Because sometimes you learn some really cool stuff when you screw up. So leaving you to screw up, I'll talk to you later. I uh, will continue talking about the recipe for meaningful gamification. 
Hi there, this is Scott Nicholson. Welcome to the Ivory Dice Tower, where I talk a little bit about games in academia, games out there in the real world, um, and trying to give you some tips and ideas of how you might want to use what you think about games to make a difference. So this time I'm going to talk about meaningful gamification. So um, in my previous episodes, I talked about the idea of gamification, the idea of using elements from games and play to motivate people um, and to get them engaged in a context. But the problem is, as I also talked about uh, back in episode 14, episode 15, episode 16, the issues of rewards. A lot of gamification today is really about taking rewards and adding them in. But it doesn't have to be. Because there's a lot of stuff in games that aren't rewards. When we play games, you know, we're playing them because we're getting things out of it. It's not just about that reward. And so I wanted to create something called meaningful gamification. Meaningful gamification is the idea of using elements from games and play that aren't reward focused, but the goal is to build meaning in, in someone about a real world context. The goal is to add a layer of something on top of something in the real world. And those elements of games and play are going to help someone to find a personal connection to that. It's different than reward-based gamification, where you're trying to incentivize people, where you're trying to motivate them through offering them incentives to say, hey, do this thing in the real world and you get this reward. Meaningful gamification is saying, hey, try this thing and here's some ways to think about it. Here's some ways to find a deeper connection. So over the next uh, seven episodes, I'm going to actually be talking about meaningful gamification because I've been working on it quite a bit and I've created what I call my recipe for meaningful gamification. There are six parts to my recipe. It's the letters of the word recipe. R for reflection, engagement, choice, information, play, and exposition. And the idea of this recipe is there are six things that you can think about using. If you want to take game elements and use them to help encourage people to engage in something, these are six ways you can do it that aren't just give them points and badges and achievements, but are something different, something deeper. And each one of these can be used to help someone find a deeper connection. And as I talk about these, I'm going to tie them into board game design because there's a lot of tricks here you can use to help people get engaged in your game in ways other than just offering them points to do things. Because if you think about it as a game designer, many times that's what people rely upon. I'm going to get you to take an action because I'm offering you points to do it. But what if there are other ways? And that's what we're going to explore over the next few episodes. If you want to learn more about this right away, you can head over to becauseplaymatters.com. There's a publications area, and you're going to find four or five articles there where I've talked about this concept in depth. Bye-bye. <laughs> It doesn't seem like there's a lot of games here, but I know a lot of people are interested in what we think about Lewis and Clark and the new expansion for Sentinels and the Multiverse Vengeance. Also, I'll be talking about the My Little Pony game this week. And from my contributors, there is a ton of reviews coming. And I'll have a few more reviews of games other than the ones that are also shown here. So look for a lot of reviews this week from the Dice Tower. Also, there's uh, shows and other things coming out. It's going to be a good week. Legacy, the testament of Duke de Crecy. The Crecy, the Cre... Legacy. This is a unique worker placement, family tree building game for one to four players. You start the game deciding who you'd like to marry, and from there your first child is born. When they are children, you can arrange their marriages, so when they grow up at the end of the round, you instantly get the benefits of the new member of your family. There are a lot of character cards that have their own nationality, job, and special ability. As your family starts to grow with each generation, you'll be able to undertake missions, buy mansions, contribute to the community, to get even more victory points with each turn. If you're having trouble having children, you can hire a fertility doctor to have two at once. Theme is oozing all over this game. Every rule has a thematic reason for being there. This is a unique fun game that is recommended for couples and even has a solo variant. It has depth of play, and each decision has game-lasting consequences. Out of five, we give this game a... Four! Please subscribe for more videos. Hey guys, welcome to Board Game Bits. Today we're taking a look at A Touch of Evil, the supernatural game designed by Jason C. Hill. So the first thing you'll see when you get the game is 16 small six-sided dice. The next thing you'll see are eight beautifully sculpted minis and each of these minis has their own unique character sheet. A 27 page fully illustrated rule book. A CD soundtrack for the game which really helps to set the mood and is, is quite a unique addition. You get the four villain sheets. And you also get the four minion chart cards for each of the four villains in the game. You get four separate unique location decks, one for the manor, the windmill, the old woods and the abandoned keep. You also get decks of lair cards, secret cards, item cards, 
and a 50 card event deck. In addition to that, we also have town elder cards. These represent the elders in the town, as well as six curse of the werewolf cards and six reference cards, which give you an overview of your turn summary as well as the game round. You get wound markers for keeping track of your damage. You get blue investigation markers, as well as a plethora of skill upgrade markers, which you use to mark buffs on your character sheet. You get a flying frog first player marker, as well as four militia markers. You have a shadow track and a shadow track marker which moves along during the course of the game. And last but not least, you get a beautifully illustrated game board. It's a sepia tone, really helps set the theme of the game and, and the mood, and uh, it's just a really, really perfect, perfect board for this game. Hey folks, if you want to discuss board games, then you need to go to our forums on Board Game Geek. Uh, you can find a real quick link on our website, dicetower.com, under forum. You go there. Uh, there's links. It's called the Dice Tower Guild at Board Game Geek. And man, it's great. You post something there, people will respond, and you miss out on a lot of great discussion. Uh, so go check those out. Uh, one of the threads that will start last week were people talking about the local store. Now, there's always been debate about the local store versus the online gaming store, and these debates will go down to the end of time. Um, but obviously, I stand on a lot of the side of the online gaming stores because I, we work with cool stuff, and we, I think cool stuff's a great store. And I also think the debate is kind of silly because cool stuff has four local gaming stores, one which I just talked about previously in Hollywood, and there's also one in Maitland, there's another one in Orlando, then there's another one um, up in Jacksonville. So they have local gaming stores. But what these people are talking about is going to a local gaming store and asking the person there for advice about board games and they point you to a specific board game and you say thank you and then you go home and you order it online. And this happens with a lot of things. People go to uh, Barnes & Nobles, they look at the book and then they'll get online and order it from Amazon. They go to the electronic store, they look at the stuff, they feel it, look at it, read the specs, you try it out and then go order it online. Now certainly you are within your rights to do that. There's no law against going and looking at something in the store and then ordering it online. But when people say, what do you think of that? It just seems like such an obvious thing to me. It's, it's a jerky thing to do. Now, it's, it's not like you, know, the, you have to go to these stores. If I want to buy a new camera, for example, the camera that I'm looking at right now, that was a new camera, I needed to buy a new camera for the Dice Tower. Well, there's a lot of cameras out there. I don't know which camera to get. So I did a lot of research and then bought the camera online. But before I bought the camera online, I did my research online. If I had gone to a store and talked to the owner of that store and had him show me around, point me to different cameras, and then found the perfect camera, and then went and bought it online, I wasted his time. And also, under false pretenses, because he thought I was going to buy from him. He was being helpful to him, and I was essentially stealing his time, which is just, again, it's not a very ethical thing to do. Uh, and so, I, one of my local stores, like I said, is, is cool stuff. The other one that I go to is The Rock in Kendall, uh, Florida. And it's a small local gaming store, Magic Scene, and the games there. And we play there every Tuesday night. And I like to buy things from them. I certainly buy snacks each time I go. I also like to buy a game from them occasionally because they allow me to play there. If a store is giving me advice, a way to meet new gamers, and or a place to game, it just makes sense that then I should give back to them somehow. And usually the best way to do that is financially. Now, one of the arguments against this is that games are much cheaper online than they are at the store. And that is true. And stores often can't compete. I'm still mind boggled sometimes when people are like, why can't I get the same discount here? Well, you're not, they're not doing the same volume. But at the same time, we have to remember that board games are entertainment. You don't need to eat board games to survive. You don't need board games. And so this whole argument, well, I'm trying to save money. Well, good, save money. But at the same time, you are getting something for free from that store that you're frequenting. You know, if you don't want to go to the store, you don't use the store, then I have no problem. Shop online. I don't care. I'm not, I don't think it's our duty to support the local gaming stores. I just think that there should be some tit for tat. If I'm going there and getting stuff from them, I definitely should support them also. I'm just kind of mind boggled that this was a debate question at all because it just seems obvious to me. Sure, you know, if you don't want to go to a local gaming store and you want to buy all your stuff online, go do it. Great. But if you're going there and playing there and meeting new gamers there and having fun and getting a lot of entertainment for a low value or no cost at all, then why not help them out? It just, I don't know. 
It just seems like an obvious thing to do. So anyway, those were my thoughts. And now it's time to talk about building that game group a bit. Hello there, Dice Tower viewers, and welcome to part four of this increasingly misnumbered two-part series on running a gaming group. Today's topic, save my spot. Ooh, that graphic looks really expensive. If I may be so bold, I would like to offer my take on a question that was featured on episode number 348 of the Dice Tower Audio Podcast. The question comes from listener Rob. Rob runs a gaming group, but when members fail to show up or are late, it can prevent his entire group from playing. So he asks, should you require people to RSVP? And how can you prevent late people from delaying the event? First off, especially when your game group is starting out, I believe RSVPing is crucial because one, it helps you pick games that will fit your expected number of players, and two, it helps show others that people are actually attending, which can help persuade new members to join. As they say, success breeds success. Sorry, I blew the entire graphics budget on that first one. I use meetup.com to post my group's events and track who signs up. A technique that I've used to prevent latecomers from delaying our games is to include the number of seats that are available plus a waiting list. Then as people RSVP, I update the posting to add them to the appropriate list. And that way people can lock in their seat for a game or see their position on the wait list. When game day arrives, if someone who has reserved a seat is late, they forfeit it to the next person in line. This system won't necessarily prevent people from being late because, let's face it, life happens, but it helps everyone know the plan, which will help everyone start on time so they can focus on having fun instead of worrying about other things. Things like hiring a new graphics department. <laughs> Hi, we're the Board Game Knights. I'm Sam Gillespie. I'm Chris Schrader. And following on from last week's introduction to Euro games, today we're going to be looking at American-style board games. American-style games, often affectionately dubbed Ameritrash games, often feature very simple mechanics and very strong themes. These games were developed by companies such as Parker Brothers in the early part of the 20th century, and they made games like Monopoly, which is very simple, has a very simple theme, and anyone can play it. These games often focus on player interaction, having aggressive combat, has a bit of luck involved, and often a bit of role play to help spice things up a bit. They often feature player elimination rather than hidden scoring, meaning that all your actions have just that little bit more risk associated with them. Euro games often focus on making an interesting mechanic and then throw a theme on for a bit more flavour, whereas American style games start with that theme and then build the mechanics around that, making things fundamentally more interesting. Now, what's really fascinating is that with this increasingly interconnected world we live in, many American-style game designers have tried to steal mechanics from Euro games, meaning that there's a lot more of this grey area, and it becomes harder and harder to classify games as either American-style or Euro-style. A great example of this is Twilight Imperium 3rd Edition. I say 3rd Edition because this edition introduced strategy cards, which other players can also use. This is a very Euro-influenced mechanic. The next game we have is King of Tokyo. King of Tokyo is just a bunch of silliness. Everyone's running around as monsters trying to destroy Tokyo and be the biggest monster around. The next game, Cutthroat Caverns, is a group dungeon crawler. We are trying to work together to de defeat monsters, but also trying to kill each other. The next game is Zombies, where you're all trying to escape a zombie horde. No surprise there. The next one is Betrayal at the House on the Hill. There's another cooperative game where halfway through the game, one of you will become the betrayer and try to beat everyone else. The last game is the Red Dragon Inn. It's basically a fantasy game where a bunch of fantasy characters come together and have fun at an inn for a night. So Euro games and American style games feature two ends of the spectrum, and we find that the best games lie somewhere between the middle, combining elements of both. Hmm. Indeed. This wraps up our overview of American style games. Enjoy the rest of your board game breakfast. And that's it for this week, folks. I'm excited about the stuff coming from the Dice Tower. We have that another top 10 list coming this week in which we'll be talking about top 10 games that replaced other games and more podcasts and all sorts of things. You can always find out all this information about our show at Dicetowernetwork.com. It was a lot of fun to meet several of you at the board game uh, meetup this past Saturday at Tabletop Day. And I hope as time goes by, 
Uh, now that my baby is starting to get a little older, I'm going to be start flying around the country to different conventions and things. Um, the next convention I think I'll be at is uh, the Cool Mini or Not convention at the end of May, and then uh, Origins and Gen Con. We'll be talking as those as time comes by. But folks, I would love to meet you if you're ever in the area. If you ever come down from Miami for vacation, feel free to email me. I might be busy. We might not be able to hook up, but if we do have time, we'd love you to come to one of our meetups and play games with us. Anyway, I'm Tom Vassell, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast. To find out more about all of our podcasts, check out Dicetowernetwork.com. To see a listing of our videos, head to Dicetower.com. We'd like to thank our sponsor, Cool Stuff Incorporated, where you can buy games for great prices. Cool Stuff in Stock.